On the uh, day of Yeats' birthday, June 13th, uh, lucky for some that it would be great to take Yeatsians to this site in West London that has so much uh, worldly significance, I would say. How's it going there? I'm Niall McDevitt, uh, poet and uh, urban topographer, psychogeographer. We're here on Blythe Road. Uh, because it's a legendary uh, uh, W.B. Yeats site. Um, the story I'm going to tell is a story to remind people that Yeats wasn't just the, the national poet, the Dublin theatre manager and the west of Ireland Sligo folklorist, but he was also a Londoner and a Londonist. Yeats depended upon London for, to find out about all the advances in the arts, aesthetic advances, and also to find out about uh, the occult. Uh, so Yeats uh, came to this street uh, because he had joined a secret society, which I will show you the premises of in a minute. But also here we have the, uh, the site of the former post office savings bank, it's a fantastic building, Blythe House. Uh, it is now where they house all of the objects that are not on display at museums like Victoria and Albert Museum. It's full of the booty of the world. Astonishing objects galore, safely housed in there. But it's also worth noticing for we Hibernophiles because it was where Michael Collins worked in the years 1906 to 1915. Right. Well, Collins was working here as a clerk and at some managerial capacity. And it's here he learnt the organisational skills that were to come to fruition the following year. Right. So, uh, the, but the site that brings us here is on the other side. It is uh, 36 Blythe Road, a legendary address in magical circles, occult circles. You see the cafe, George's Cafe. Already a synchronicity because Yeats's future wife would be known as George. But that cafe is the ground floor of 36 Blythe Road. It's good because that means any Yeats fan can go there and have a, have a meal and sit, absorb the ambience of the site. But the first floor is where the real interest is because for 10 years, from 1890 to the year 1900, Yeats and his fellow uh, members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. They gathered in, in the first floor of this house to practice ritual magic, and that is why the site is of such significance. Brenda Maddox even thinks there should be a plaque for Yeats here. Um, the story goes that Yeats was, um, he was, he was living down further west in Chiswick, uh, in Bedford Park with his dad and the whole family. Uh, Mum was going quietly mad. Dad was impecunious bohemian painter. And the two sisters, Lily and Lolly, were learning their trade with William Morris. Yeats was writing. Uh, but he had joined the Theosophical Society under Madame Blavatsky, also meeting in West London, Lansdowne Road. And he wanted to actually do ritual magic. And that's when he got in touch with the organization called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Uh, it was run by uh, a very eccentric, charismatic, brilliant character called Samuel Little MacGregor Mathers. Mathers took Yeats under his wing, initiated him into the Order of the Golden Dawn. That was the outer order. So that was the first order. Um, after a while, you got initiated into the second order, and that's the order we're talking about here. Also known as the Rosier Rubier et Aurora Crucis, the Red Rose and the Gold Cross. And the name of the temple was the Isis Urania Temple. Imagine that. You've got an Isis temple in Hammersmith. Um, Yeats would meet with Mathers and uh, lots of other interesting characters, such as uh, Arthur Machen, the writer, 
Uh, Constance Wilde was a member for a while. Yeats got Maud Gorn involved. Lots of very interesting people came here in the decade that Yeats was uh, hanging around. People don't know what kind of thing they were doing, you know, and it's much mocked, much derided. Let's just take one example of how this, uh, how this study helped you. Yeats called this, he said, this is my church and my university, right? That's pretty serious, my church and my university. One example of an exercise which came in useful for Yeats, McGregor Mathers put a kind of piece of dark cardboard over Yeats's eyes and said, visualize, get visualizing, right? Just see what you see. So Yeats closed his eyes, had the cardboard pressed over him, and he began visualizing what he called a, a black titan, some kind of strange, gigantic form which he imagined at the bottom of the sea. This was in 1895. About 25 years later, when he writes the poem, The Second Coming, and he has a, a vision of a kind of half lion, half man in the desert, it was that vision that he had here with McGregor Mathers that became the central vision in his most famous apocalyptic poem, The Second Coming. So that's what Yeats said himself, magic gave him metaphors for his poetry. But he also said to skeptics, magic is the center of all my work, all my being. So. Uh, the stuff going on here, you might laugh at it, but it was important, very much so to Yeats. One of the things they had in there was a vault, right? It was like a beautiful wooden construction made in the shape of an octagonal tomb, the tomb being that of uh, the legendary character Christian Rosenkreutz. Rosenkreutz is the Rosy Cross. So this was a kind of Masonic order but it was split off, it was a Rosicrucian Masonic order, uh, and then it split off into its own thing, and was really one of the first great Western occult revival societies, specializing in Western magic, Hermetic, Hermes, Greek. They didn't want to have the Tibetan and Indian stuff that Blavatsky was doing, it was Western occult, that's what, they, that's what they were reviving, and it's been incredibly influential. But what happened was, this thing called the Battle of Blythe Road happened. They say McGregor Mathers, the leader, moves to Paris, but he's still in charge. He's an autocrat, and he needs the money. He's always initiating people, getting the initiation fees. And the rest of the crew, Yates, his friend Florence Farr, a great actress, Annie Horniman, the heiress, who bankrolled the Abbey. These were other characters involved, Very lots of women. That's another important thing about this. Women were allowed, and that was what made it so interesting, because there was really interesting women involved. Uh, McGregor Mathers uh, was falling out with the rest of the order, and they were preparing to depose him. Meanwhile, the young Alistair Crowley, who's now regarded as the most famous magician of the 20th century, he had been initiated as a member of the Outer Order, but he wanted to become a member of the Inner Order. Yeats refused. Right. Yeats said, we did not think that a magical society should also double as a reformatory. And he called Crowley a person of unspeakable life. This, this was probably to do with rumors of Crowley's homosexuality, which, in which he just dabbled, but also because Crowley was actually learning magic at an alarmingly fast rate from a, from a rogue magician. Crowley hated Yeats because Yeats didn't like Crowley's poetry, and Crowley felt Yeats was jealous of his far superior uh, accomplishments in poetry. Uh, but Yeats thought Crowley was simply a degenerate. So what happened was, Crowley then goes to Paris, gets initiated into the second order by Mathers, and Mathers then gives him instructions to break in and steal the vault, the magical wooden, t the magical wooden uh, tomb of Christian Rosenkreutz, the Rosy Cross, the mythical leader. So that's what the vault is. It's like a kind of tomb. You can sit inside it and do magical rituals. You can sit inside and visualize yourself. You can sit inside, wear robes and chant Latin, all that kind of thing. So in the year 1900, things come to a head. Crowley appears, lets himself in, and uh, surveys the vault 
and surveys the structure of the place and decides, right, I'm going to come back with a couple of henchmen and steal the vault. Uh, he then breaks in a couple of days later, changes the locks, and that, by now Yates and all his pals are really, really worried, um, and they're aware that there's an onslaught. Crowley is trying to uh, uh, take over the premises, take over the temple, and steal valuable artifacts. Um, then, April 19th, Yates is here. He's forewarned. Yates is here with uh, another member of the organization called Hunter, who's a professional pugilist, right? Fisticuffs. Um, Yates comes back on April 19th, changes the locks back from Crowley's locks, and waits, waits for Crowley. They know there's going to be an assault. Sure enough, round the corner down there comes this character dressed in full Highland regalia. Kilt, sparring, a sheath, and a, and a Highland dirk. But then there's a, a mask, an Egyptian touch, a mask of Osiris. So this guy comes stomping down the road, right? I always imagine, I always imagine Yates saying to the hunter, the pugilist, do you think this is him? <laughs> so uh, what happens is a standoff at the door, uh, Latin imprecations are hurled. They, they both have, when you're a member of this order, you have a Latin nickname, right? So guess what Yeats's nickname was? And again, this uh, belies the stuffy, fuddy-duddy image of the National Poet. Yeats's nickname was Demon est Deus Inversus. That is Latin for a demon is an inverse god. Quite Blakey, isn't it? Demon is an inverse god. Demon est Deus Inversus. You can shorten that to D-E-D-I, Deddy. <laughs> so I always say, you know, come to Deddy. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> Crowley's nickname is Perdurabo, the one who will persevere, the one who will endure. So basically it was Demon est Deus Inversus versus Perdurabo, with a little bit of help from the pugilist. And uh, what seems to have happened is Crowley was dispelled and he, he, he was sent packing without any vault or without any magical implements. Uh, a couple of minutes later, a couple of hired thugs turned up and said, have you seen Master Crowley? Where's Master Crowley? So it's possible that um, the twisty, turny Blythe Road confused the thugs. But if they turned up earlier, it's possible that Crowley would have taken possession of the temple finally. There was a, a court case, uh, and, and it, it kind of a legal dispute happened. So Crowley sued for the vault. But what was happening all the time was Yates was writing letters to Lady Gregory. He was living there. He lived there for more than a week to prevent more break-ins. And he was. He said, "I only got about four hours sleep over the last three nights." So Yates, imagine Yates is wide awake on the first floor, trying to prevent any more magical onslaughts. Um, very, very dramatic stuff. And then when the whole business was over, the court case collapsed. They found some dirt on Crowley. Uh, all was resolved happily in the order's favor. They all met here. Yates was made imperator. Um, and all seemed to have, you know, all seemed to be okay. But really, this was, this was like the fin de siècle was over. Yates's mother would die that year. He'd lost Maud Gone. He realized Maud Gone already had kids. He, he stopped writing poetry for a while. Um, it was a very, very, very dark, very dark time for Yeats. And so his victory in the Battle of Blythe Road was a kind of hollow victory. But if we remember the Second Coming poems, and not only did it have the vision of the Titan, but the, uh, the famous final line, what rough beast slouches towards Bethlehem to be born, People say that's actually an image of Aleister Crowley, right? Crowley called himself the Beast. Um, and in the contretemps between Yeats and Crowley, Yeats would in 1923 win the Nobel Prize for Literature, whereas uh, Crowley would end up in the tabloid headlines as the wickedest man in the world. So the Yeats-Crowley contretemps seemed to be something that uh, Yeats kind of won out on eventually. But of course, since both of their deaths, they are now regarded as two giants in 20th century culture. Yeats is, of course, the greatest poet, but also a formidable magician. Crowley is regarded as the greatest magician, 
a minor poet, but an important writer. So there, there are two, uh, one is Ireland, one is England, and it re this, this remains a fascinating personality clash in which everyone can find some kind of amazing resonance. Um, certainly for me, uh, as a, an Irish poet living in West London, I found this to be a very significant uh, and quite mind-boggling sight. I'm here at 36 Blythe Road, um, where Yeats studied on the first floor ritual magic for 10 years from 1890 to the year 1900. It's one of the great Yeats sites in the world, in London. And uh, I'm going to read a poem that he wrote as a tribute to the magicians he was working with. These are people like Florence Farr, the actress, W.H. Horton, the painter, McGregor Mathers, and all these other characters who came in and out of this uh, Isis temple upstairs. The poem is called The Magi. Now as at all times I can see in the mind's eye, in their stiff painted clothes, the pale unsatisfied ones appear and disappear in the blue depth of the sky with all their ancient faces like rain-beaten stones and all their helms of silver hovering side by side and all their eyes still fixed hoping to find once more being by Calvary's turbulence unsatisfied the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. <laughs>